Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to my study. And here's a, a verse that I think will probably puzzle us if we stop and have a look at it. Just uh, take a look at uh, Isaiah 33, 7, and ask yourself, what must have happened to bring uh, these people to this state? Hit pause, reflect, come back. course it's perfectly possible that this is just um, emotional Middle Eastern people and the struggle to understand this is because you could never imagine the mighty warriors say the SAS or Navy SEALs crying aloud in the streets um, so public uh, without shame without embarrassment can you imagine uh, the diplomatic service, the British Foreign Commonwealth Office, their senior envoys to, to Washington or Moscow, uh, weeping bitterly? The image here is, is precisely that. It's the end of um, military power. Uh, the army of Assyria is going to sweep in to, uh, to, to, to swallow up Judah. And this vast army, a huge army... Uh, 100, 200,000 people gathered around Jerusalem, sort of like like a head that's been caught in a noose. And the, the mighty men of Judah on the walls of Jerusalem look out and, and weep because they've no hope at all. Uh, the the envoys from the king, they've, they've stripped the, the city bare. Every article of any worth has been gathered together and these... Uh, they they basically take a bribe out to the the king uh, the, the the king's uh, soldiers, and Sennacherib blasts at them, and uh, takes their money, and says, "I'm going to destroy you." That's Assyria. But what comes after in verses eight and nine is something bigger altogether, isn't it? The highway is deserted, no travellers on the roads, um, uh, the land dries up. But what land is that? Uh, Lebanon, uh, mighty Lebanon, ashamed and with us. Sharon, beautiful Sharon, is like the, the desert wastes. Uh, Bashan and Carmel drop their leaves. It is a, a, a region-wide cataclysm. I think this is probably looking onwards from Assyria through to, to Babylon uh, and the final exile of all these peoples. So, so Isaiah has... has at least two horizons, possibly final judgment. Well, we'll see that in chapter 34, that he's got three horizons in view within these chapters. And the question is, what hope? For, uh, for Judah, they've tried everything. They've tried pretending that Assyria is not coming. They've tried diplomacy. They've tried military might. They've tried alliances with Egypt. Nothing's worked. They are about to be swallowed up. The most one-sided battle you could imagine. And they're either facing exile, uh, perhaps um, uh, being, being shaved from head to foot, walking around in rags uh, as slaves forever, or, or dying on the battlefield. And it's in that context, when the people are, uh, are broken, that... Uh, you then get verse 10. And notice there are three parallel statements. The now is quite emphatic. Now will I arise, says the Lord. Now will I be exalted. Now will I be lifted up. I'm going to do something profound, extraordinary. It's going to glorify me. It's going to show you that, yes, you have nothing left to give, but if you trust me, and verse 2 sees them crying out to God, doesn't it? You'll see what I'll do. And then he says, you conceive chaff. That is, you 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 plot and plan, but you give birth to straw, to, to waste, to nothing. Your breath is a fire that consumes so chaff, straw, very, very flammable. You know, everything you've produced will burn up by your own deeds. But this is not about Jerusalem. The people will be burned to ashes. 
like cut thorn bushes they will be set ablaze. God is going to come and bring such a justice that it's it's as if the the people's own acts have have burned them up. God is going to arise. God is going to be the protector of his people. God is going to act when they cannot. And of course, we see that supremely, don't we? Even as as chapter 34 takes us to um, the, the, the throne room and the judgment of God and the whole world becoming a burning waste, we know that we deserve that. We'll come to that tomorrow. There's a, there's a very probing question there in verse uh, 14. We know we deserve that. We know we have nothing left to give. We can try bartering with death. We can try buying off the devil. We we can try pretending that we're not sinners facing judgment. But actually, we have nothing to give except our sin. We give it over to God. And the Lord arises and, and defeats our enemies, sin, the devil and death. And he does what we cannot do. He steps forward when we are left with nothing but weeping. It is the Lord who saves. It is the Lord who arises. And he does it in such a way that only he gets the glory. Now will I be exalted. That's right, isn't it? We, we need to be a people who understand our predicament. It's a hard couple of chapters to look at this week. We need to understand our predicament because it's only in understanding what we're facing and how we have no resources of our own to, to deal with it, that we can hope, hope to properly grasp what God has done for us. Now, these will be hard verses, but I hope that they will push us to exult in our God, to delight in him, and to cling ever harder to the Lord Jesus. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, would you please give us such visions of both your great goodness, your power, and your grace to your people, and that from which you are saving us, that we might with sober judgment weigh ourselves, understand ourselves. And Father, would you uh, cause us, yes, to, to be honest with ourselves, but also to be delighting in you. For Jesus' sake. Amen.